Hey, it's good to be with you this morning. I just want to spend some time with you in God's Word. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I know life can put a bitter taste in your mouth, but I want you to know that in Christ, we can have something so sweet, something so pure, something so perfect, that it can change whatever you're in, whatever you're going through, Christ can change that situation. He has power. And I want you to look with me at this text. I'm going to read the whole text. And the reason I'm going to do this, I'm going to read verses 1 through 15, is because I want you to see the last little bit of verses. Because next week, that's the controversial verses. So bring your friends. (laughs) Bring your friends. The controversial sermon is next week. This one's just about Jesus. So we can do that. But next week will be when all the fireworks go off. Okay? So I'm going to read to you the first seven verses. And you'll see some beauty here. Some absolute beauty. And then the next few verses, there's beauty there too. We just have to dig a little deeper to find it, all right? So let's listen. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved And to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. Which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And then. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. That's good, good advice. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectful apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. That will be fun. But, But with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I'll get fired on that one. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet shall we be saved through childbearing. She shall be saved through childbearing. That's even the toughest of them all. If they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, you know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get you to come back next week. (laughs) This passage is powerful. It has a lot to say about relationships and respect between us and God and us and one another. So nothing really all that controversial here. But when you first read it, it grabs your attention, doesn't it? But I want you to think about where we're at in this book and what we're doing right now. In the second chapter, we're looking at worship. Really, that's the theme of this chapter. Chapter 2 is about worship. And last week, we focused on uh, Paul as he shows us the preaching and teaching elements. If you'll look through that text, you see that he speaks of being a preacher and a teacher, and he, and he talks about being an apostle. And so all of those elements help us to understand that a big part of worship is we come here and we learn about who God is. And the preaching part, the proclamation part, is what inspires us, I believe, to go out and fulfill the Great Commission. So preaching and teaching. And then that last bit that I just read to you, again, if you look closely, it's about relationships and respect. It's about learning how to work together and each of us finding our place. And I know, ladies, when you first read that, it seems like your place is is like, you know, sit down and be quiet kind of thing. But that's not at all what Paul is saying. You, You need to understand the cultural context here. But before we get into that, what we need to do is deal with today's subject. Because tucked right in the middle of this passage, we see Jesus. So if you think about it, if we're talking about worship and we're wanting to learn about worship, yes, when we come to worship, we need to think about the preaching and teaching element. We also need to think about the fellowship element and how we relate to one another. But all of that is tied together by what? By Jesus, by Christ. Right in the middle of the text, if you look there in in verse 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Friends, if we want to understand who we are as a church, and if we want to understand what we're called to do as a church and as individuals in the church, it has to be about Christ-centeredness. Thomas Brooks put it this way, he who leans upon and only upon Christ 
lives the highest, choicest, safest, and sweetest life. Thomas Brooks was the greatest of the Puritan, uh, one of the great Puritan preachers and teachers himself. And one of the things I love about the Puritans is they understood the sweetness of Jesus. When we really get to know Christ, it will sweeten our lives. Whatever bitterness you bring into the equation, Jesus can sweeten that deal. He can take you from the darkest place and bring you into the light. And that's why today we need to think about being Christ-centered. Our worship has to be Christ-centered. As Mark Dever says, we need to preach Christ, sing Christ, pray Christ. We just need Christ in every element. When people come into this church, sure, they'll learn uh, fancy new words and fascinating new thoughts. But ultimately, what we want them to walk away with is Jesus in their hearts, having changed them and transformed them. Jesus is the centerpiece of all that we do and all that we say and all that we sing and pray here at First Baptist Church. It's about Jesus. Now, friends, we have to get that down deep inside. We have to remember that that is the goal every day is to be a Christ-centered person as a part of a Christ-centered church. Because if we aren't Christ-centered people and we're not contributing to a Christ-centered church, what we will be is a me-centered person and we'll have a me-centered church. And nothing will kill this church quicker than you and me and all of us, each individually wanting the me to be magnified instead of Christ. And one of the ways we do that is we remember it's not the me, it's the we. It's all of us. It's, it's about each of us doing our part in contributing. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what we do. If it's not Christ-centered, we're heading toward a shipwreck. If our, if our hearts and souls aren't saturated with the joy that Jesus gives us. Friends, people, people are not going to come and spend time with us. They're not going to sit down and, and spend time with us in this moment if, if they don't feel Christ. Friends, we, we don't need to just come here to get filled up on Jesus. We need to come here filled up with Jesus. And that way, the people who we do bring and invite and, and bring into this place, they feel Jesus. His love, His power. So today what I want to do is just look at this text. It gives you three very basic images of who Christ is. This is theology 101, nothing fancy, but it is the kind of truth that changes lives. It's the kind of truth that each of us, no matter how many times you've heard about Jesus, if you're here today and you've heard sermons on Jesus for 80 years of your life, I want to tell you, you if you live another 80 years, you can't get enough of it. Jesus is that good. Even if you're Methuselah, and some of us look like it now. 969 years isn't enough to exhaust the richness of Christ. Amen? We could spend our whole lives learning about Him. Let's start with what I think is the most basic and powerful element of who Christ is. And that is, He is a Savior. Did you see this? He is a Savior. Look at verse 3. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Friends, we need to start there because today, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, then I believe that's why you're here. And we need to talk about what that means. It pleased Christ to die for your sins. It was His desire to rescue you from your sins. And if you look at this passage, we talked about it last week, but chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 really focuses this whole thing on prayer. If we as a church are serious about souls, we'll be seriously on our knees together in prayer, seeking God and His power, talking to Christ, asking Christ to fill our lives. And when we do that, when we're praying, when we're giving our hearts in prayer, I believe it is the prayer-centered life that becomes the Christ-centered life that promotes Godly dignity that is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, verse 3. Friends, I, I want to tell you, you can say all day long that you want to see people come to know Jesus and go and be with Him forever in heaven, but if you've not invested two minutes in prayer in the last two years, then don't tell me that you're really committed to seeing people know Jesus because I want you to know there is no power in me or you that can rescue and save a lost soul. The only power in the universe that does that is the power of Jesus. 
He is the Savior. And if you, Christian, if you, church member, are not talking to Him, don't expect that you'll be speaking up for Him. If you're not talking to Him, you will not be speaking up for Him. I am convinced. I'm going to share with the executive board of the Missouri Baptist Convention tomorrow. I am convinced of this message. That the problem for all of us is that we have forgotten the, the place of prayer in the gospel. We have forgotten that, that the gospel goes forth and it changes lives. But it always starts in an upper room. It always starts with God's people on their knees in prayer. It always happens when we stop depending on ourselves. And start trusting in the Savior and His power. Oh, church people know that language of getting saved. If you grew up in Kentucky, there's Kentucky again. You know, getting saved and, and, and language of salvation was part of the parlance. That's how you talk. Except for you don't use words like parlance. You get beat up in Kentucky. I never fit in anywhere. <laughs> Poor me. But anyway... Yeah, you know, we talk about getting saved, but do we really understand what we're talking about? What that means? What is Christ saving us from? That is such an important part. And I want you to realize that the consistent message of the Bible is that human beings are broken creatures. And you're broken by your own sin. First and foremost, sure, have you been hurt? Yes. If you're here this morning and you're burying a wound because someone has hurt you. Don't hear me wrong. We want to care for you. We want to provide the comfort of the Lord in your heart. But I want to tell you, the burdens you bear because of the wounds you bear, that's not your spiritual problem. Ultimately, your spiritual problem is when you have sinned against God and others. What condemns you is not that you've been broken, but that you have broken the command of God. And Jesus understood this, and his heartbeat was to deliver his children from spiritual death to bring deliverance or salvation for our souls. If you do not feel the weight of your sin, you will not feel any need for a Savior. And I think that's the number one problem today, is that people in our culture, we have bought into this this idea that everybody's okay, that, that nobody's really sinful, that everybody means well. And so what we do as a culture is we really struggle with the concept that I have sinned against God. But the Bible is so clear that we have. And we need to realize that it's not in little ways, but in big ways. And what happens is, is that we are so busy. The pace of life is furious, isn't it? And we are so busy. I want to tell you, I believe the devil is so happy with you being so busy that you are so distracted that you never take the time to really consider the state of your heart. Where is the quiet time in your life where you're really hearing God speak? Life is frenetic. It is a pace that is hard to keep up with. You've got kids going this way and that way. You have jobs that have expectations piled on top of expectations. You have uh, grandkids that, that are running 15 different directions and you're trying to be here and you're trying to be there and you're trying to be a good father, a good mother, a good grandmother, a good grandfather. You're trying to be a good employee, a good boss. You're trying to be all these things and we're never quiet enough to really ask the question, where does my heart stand before God? Where am I? Who am I in relation to my God? And I want you to realize that we are so distracted that we rarely have time to think about our own souls, much less the salvation of other souls. I believe the reason why so many of us are not sharing our faith is because we're so busy, we're not even considering where we stand with God, much less taking the time and going through the mess of helping someone else to consider where they stand with God. You see, Jesus is a mighty Savior, and He works through His people. But His people are so busy doing so many things that we don't get involved. We don't see it. We don't hear it. We don't hear it in our own heart. And we're not sharing the heart of God with others. But I want to tell you, regardless of where you've been, what you've done, hear me again. 
Jesus is a saving God. And if you will hear his voice, I believe he will help you see your brokenness. He will help you understand what you need to do to be a part of the great work that he does in reaching out to hurting souls. We want to see souls saved. It is very good. It is very good to be involved in the salvation of souls. If you look at this passage, it's, it is a tricky passage in some ways. It speaks of what pleases God, who is our Savior. And notice it says that he desires all people to be saved. And some might read this and say, well, that in the end, you know, everybody's going to be saved, that God's going to universally apply uh, his gift. And, and the language here even, even seems to seem that way. In verse 6, it says that, that he gave himself as a ransom for all. But when we look at all of Scripture, the Scriptures do not teach universalism, that it doesn't matter what you do or where you go or who you are, that God's going to save everybody because that's just who He is. No, what the Scriptures tell us is, is that God's love is powerful. His saving power is, is unlimited, I believe. But the limiting factor is that so many people, and don't you know this is true, so many people have no desire to be in a relationship with God. Because they're enamored with their selves. They're lost in their own lives and lost in their own sins. And I don't believe that God desires for any soul to remain condemned. Ezekiel 33 tells us that in several other passages. God is not that kind of God. But God is also the kind of God who loves us. And love is not something that we can just push on the other. It's something that has to be received. And when the Bible speaks of the elect, the elect aren't really special in any way other than they've received this great love. And it's a mystery, and we could spend hours trying to figure it out. But let me tell you, if you're here today, okay, there's a reason for it. And the reason is, you're here today to hear this message that Jesus' love is so powerful, and your sins are so great, but in the end, His love wins that tug of war when you receive, by grace, by faith, when you receive the message of Jesus, the saving power of Jesus, the trump card is his. He has the ability to, to save you. All we can do is really cry out and ask to be saved. He is a savior. And the salvation that you need and the situation you're in is more desperate than you know. Jesus is calling out to you. Throughout the Bible, you see images of this. You see in the Old Testament Deuteronomy 4, 37, you see Israel being called out of Egypt. In fact, even in the New Testament, in John 15, 16, you see the disciples being called out to bear fruit. And I believe in verse 4, we see that God is calling us to the knowledge of the truth. We all have to realize the problem. We all need to realize the solution. And that is in Jesus the Bible tells us that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God is waiting patiently to save you. And it is through the context of the church that we can hear this message consistently and we can pray together consistently and hopefully see people consistently receiving Jesus as their savior, saving us from sin, giving us what our souls need most. Look at verse five. Verse five, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the second subject. There's Christ the Savior. Now we have Christ the mediator. Now, in this context, we need to understand that a mediator is a go-between, right? A connecting factor between two opposing parties. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but if you are still living in sin, you are the opposing party of God. When you are clinging to your sins, you are in opposition to a holy God. And that, dare I say it, is a problem. Now, let's talk about what it means to mediate. And mediation requires communication. Even when in this room, for the most part, we share the same culture and values and heritage, isn't it true that sometimes we don't connect? Isn't it true that sometimes we don't communicate well with one another? Now, 
um, in a few weeks, I'll be preaching, in two weeks, I'll be preaching in Italy, in a, in a church there, and I'll be preaching through a translator, and Natasha's English is superb, but it's going to be a challenge uh, to preach, and there's that level, uh, that barrier between myself and the congregation. So uh, this translator is going to be a mediator in a very real sense, in terms of language, okay? But I want you to get that in your mind. Can you imagine how long a sermon would be here if we had to have a translator? Okay, I'm just, yeah, I'm just saying, okay? It could be longer, it could be worse, so bear with me, okay? So now, get this in your head. The more different the culture, the more difficult the mediation. Now, realize that what the scriptures are telling us here is that Jesus is a mediator between us and a perfect, holy God. You couldn't have two entities more opposite, more unlike the other. There is nothing more extremely different than you, than God, because God is extremely perfectly holy and you are not. And here is this mediator that fills this gap, and the gap is infinite. There, there, there really isn't any a way for a holy God. God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is true. Jesus said that. But Jesus comes and he is the word become flesh. He is God in the flesh. And what he is able to do is he is able to bridge the gap. And he, even the cross behind me, we see it. The, the, the cross member there is a bridge, a bridge between the perfect holiness of God and the true sinfulness of man, but he is the mediator. It is an unfathomable gap, and yet it is breached. It is reached. It is gone across by Jesus. You see, Jesus coming down, when you read John chapter 1, every time you ought to be amazed that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, apart from that, there is no way for us to be Saved, as we were talking about a moment ago. There is no way to bridge the gap. And from the beginning of time, humanity has been crying out for help. Very quickly, turn with me. I want you to see this. I think this is important enough to take just a minute and look at. Turn to Job chapter 9. Man, oh man, we don't hear much from Job. Uh, except for we know that he had a hard time, right? Difficult time. Well, the struggles that Job went through with his family and with his faith are profound, but one of the things that Job helps us see is that even though Job may be the oldest book in our Bible, his plight is the same plight that we have today. There's a connection here with something very old, and it shows uniformity in the human experience. Look at uh, chapter 9, verse 2. Job says, truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? That's the question, right? He knows that God is good, and that's the, the, the conversation before this. He knows that God is just, but he asks the question, how can I be right with God? He is perfect. I have no way to connect with him. Now skip down to verse, uh, let's see here, where are we at? 33. So near the end of the chapter, he cries out, there is no arbiter, which is another word for mediator. Okay. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hands on us both. Do you see this? Job is crying out. He says, I need help. I need somebody to reach out and touch my heart and save me. I need an arbiter. I need a mediator. And he's crying out. Look at verse 25. He says, my days are swifter than a runner. Then they flee away. They see no good. He's saying, look, my life is short. I need this touch from God. I need to be reached by God. I'm running out of time. There's desperation in his voice. He knows the judgment and wrath of God. He's seen it with his own eyes. He's looking for help. Look at verses 10 and 11. It speaks of the God who, verse 9, who's, who's made the, 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 the stars in the sky, as it were. But verse 10, who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. Behold, verse 11, he passes by me and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. You see, this is the problem. Before Jesus came, 
Man could know that God was good. Man could say, oh, wow, God moved. Like, for instance, when, when, when uh, God gave Moses the law or when Joshua saw uh, the captain of the Lord come in and deliver his people and deliver the, the, the holy land, the promised land for them, they saw God move. They knew that he was real, but they couldn't grab hold of him. It was like God would just always be just out of reach. And then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw him, we see uh, Peter say, and we, we heard him and we, we held him. We, we touched him. We, 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 were, we were, had a full sensory experience with Jesus who was God. And so Job cries out at the beginning of the story, so to speak, of the Bible. As, not as far back as it goes, but one of the earliest books we have. And he cries out, God, give me a mediator. And then Paul says, guess what? For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. So what Job cried out for. Jesus was. That's what you need. There's a tension in your heart. Sometimes you're quiet enough. It's rare in our culture, but it's, it does happen from time to time. Sometimes your soul is quiet enough to realize that you're broken and you're hurting. There's, there's moments of honesty, spiritual honesty, where you realize that not only is the world messed up, but so are you. And in those moments when you feel so low because you know your sins and you look up and you see God so high and he seems so separated from you. That's when Jesus can say, but I will bridge the gap. I will come and give you what you need. And that brings us to our final point, and that is that Jesus is our ransom. You see, it's not just that Jesus came down and said, hello. I'm God. How are you today? He came and he spoke and he preached and, and beautiful things happened in the three years of ministry. What a powerful, powerful three-year period of time it was. But ultimately, Jesus didn't come just to teach. He, he shows us who he is. He proves that he is the Son of God. But ultimately, he came as our ransom, who gave himself as a ransom for all. You see, to build the bridge, a man had to die. And it was the God-man, Jesus Christ. And it is the picture of the cross that we see in our mind's eye right now. We can see the empty cross because we know he is risen. But you can see in your mind's eye Jesus suffering on that cross. And we are reminded when we see that picture in our mind that the price of sin is high. The price of my sin is that Jesus had to be nailed to that cross. The only way that the price could be paid was if Jesus paid it all. We sing that beautiful hymn, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. But you see, it's sin that leaves the crimson stain. But only the blood of Jesus washes it white as snow. And today what we need to come to realize is, is that our sin is no small matter. In the language of pop culture, it's just an oops, it's a mistake, it's a oh well, just another bad day. But I want you to know that Romans 3.23 tells us that it is death. We are told uh, by Paul and other Bible writers that, that sin leads to death. Jesus says that for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Not all, but many will be saved. I believe that heaven is a big, big place because many will receive this message of faith. Listen, this is not complicated. It's just this simple. You are a sinner. It's a debt you cannot pay. Jesus is a savior and he is willing to pay the price for you. And we receive this when we hear that and when we realize, I know I'm a sinner I know there's a solution. I know that Jesus is that solution. It's in that moment that we have to open our hearts and receive by faith this beautiful hope. And, and when that happens, as we read in 1 John and many other places, it will change you. It will transform you. If you are truly saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, you will not be the same person moving forward that you were in the days gone by. 
He will radically alter you. And the problem is today, there are so many people who say that they know Jesus, but they've really not been changed all that much. The trajectory of their lives maybe went a degree closer to being good, but it really wasn't a transformation. And we wonder why we are so weak. Maybe it's because our strength is in something other than this Savior. But we know that when Christ came, he knew knew what we needed. He was willing to pour out his soul to death, that he would be numbered with the transgressors, that he would bear the sins of many and make intercession for the transgressors. That's Isaiah 53. That's a prophecy of Jesus, the Christ. Jesus knew that he had to suffer for us. Listen, all of us at one point have had to come to realize that we were captured by sin. The word ransom, you know, you you think about that word and a ransom is a payment, right, that, you, that someone pays to, to, to bring somebody else out of captivity. You're in captivity when you are in sin. And you, you can't pay the price. Your blood is not holy and righteous. A sacrifice on your part may be noble, but it's not enough. Only the blood of Jesus can set us free. Sin has captured you. The blood of Jesus will set you free. And the gospel message that we proclaim to you, the public proclamation of worship of the church, is that this Jesus is a savior who has spanned the gap, connected with us, and ultimately died for our sins. And when when we believe in him and we trust in him, what he gives us is the ability to have abundant life, new life in this world, but also the resurrection life of Jesus Forever and ever. What we're talking about here today is the difference maker between heaven and hell. Darkness and light. Friends, you must believe. In this moment, I pray that with all my yelling, that there's been just enough time for your soul to be quieted. For you to realize that What's at the center of your life is not Christ. If if you're feeling that, then that's the Spirit speaking to you. You're, You're here today, I believe. If that's you, you're here today because God wants you to receive the message that Job longed to hear. That the Savior has come. He's come for you. And Christian, if it is true, if what I've said is true today, why are you holding back? Why are you dragging your feet? Why are you not sharing this message? I'm going to go back to what I said a minute ago. I'm convinced the reason why is not because you're a bad person. (laughs) It's because you've not been a faithful prayer. You will not. Be the soul winner until you are the prayer warrior. And I'm asking you to take seriously this faith that we share one with another. And I'm going to ask you to to, to just be quiet. Find calm. Find Sabbath. Find Christ. Pray with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you concerned that we haven't had as many baptisms as we did in days gone by? You can point it out, but what are you doing to change the tide? I, I'm telling you, I, I, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that, that we're not seeing people come to know the Lord every Sunday. But there's a reason for that. It's because we've got off the mark. And we do from time to time. But all we have to remember is that it is Christ. Put Him in the center Put him in the middle of our prayer lives. And I want to tell you, we do that. We begin to pray earnestly with one another for souls. I'm going to tell you there's power coming. And the flood of revival will wash over this place. Friends, it's time for us to realize how good it is we've got it. Did your mom ever tell you that? Well, you've got it so good, you don't even know how good you've got it. You know? 
And I want to tell you, I feel like my mama right now talking to, to her children, but these, you're, I guess you're kind of my children. You're the sheep. I don't know. I'm the shepherd or whatever metaphor you want to use there. Do you know how good you have it? You have Christ. Need anything else? Is that enough? I, I hope it is. Because if we'll just grab on to that truth, we'll be a Christ-centered church. And between here and Italy and Taiwan and everything in between, every place in between, spiritual renewal and revival will come. Let's put Christ in the middle.